Hey, welcome. Thank you for tuning in today uh, here with us at City Soul Ministries. We are in our new series through the Ten Commandments, and today uh, we are going to study together the second commandment that uh, the Lord God gave to His chosen nation, uh, Israel. We're going to be today in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 4 through 6. Uh, if you didn't listen to, to last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to that message over the first commandment, where we read that, uh, that we are to have no other gods, that the Lord God is the one true God. So today we're going to continue in this, um, this uh, idea of, of worship and uh, understanding what worship is and how our relationship with God is supposed to be, of course, on His conditions and what He has commanded us to do. So let's read Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, where it says this, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything, that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers to the children, on the children to the third and the fourth generation, of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, if I was to visit your home, to, to randomly show up to your home, I bet that you don't have a wooden carved statue of a god on your fireplace. And surrounding that wooden statue is candles and incense and all of these different things, to kind of the shrine uh, to your uh, god that you bow down to. And every day you bow down in prayer to that statue and you worship that statue and that statue is your god. I don't think that any of us uh, here, any of you listening to, that, to this message, have that in, in your house. Well, around the corner from, <clears throat> from my house, there is a house that has a, uh, a Buddha statue in their front landscaping. And every time we ride our bikes by there, or walk by there, I see this pretty massive statue uh, in this, uh, in this, certain, at this certain house's landscaping. And every time I walk by, the second commandment comes to, to my mind. I, I've never seen the people living there who, they, they don't go out and like bow down to the statue or, or anything like that. But I would guess that if, if I would run into them and ask them the question about their statue, they, were, they would affirm that there is <clears throat> some sort of spiritual purpose of them having this statue. Like I said, I don't think they would necessarily bow down to it, but they would affirm that there is some sort of value spiritually in why they have this statue in their landscaping. Well, the problem with the Buddha statue, the wooden statue, or any statue is is very simple. They are all made by human hands, but are, are seen as having some sort of spiritual purpose or spiritual value to the person who, who owns them. Well, that, of course, is in direct violation of this second commandment. These carved images become gods to people. This command forbids that the fact that anything that is attractive to our eyes could possibly become an idol in our lives. Every single human being is born with the desire to worship something. We are all sinners, and since we are made in the image of God, we all desire to, to worship something. You may say, well, I think I have someone who won't worship anything, or I think I've, I know of a group of people who would never worship anything, and that would be an atheist. An atheist doesn't worship anything, and maybe that's what you're thinking as you're listening to this message today. Well, you would say they don't believe in a God, so there's nothing in their life that they are, that they are worshiping. Well, I would, <clears throat> I would say back to you that <clears throat> the atheist worships atheism. Their lives are driven by the fact that that they don't believe in a God. So, so in a sense, that belief and that drive of, of atheism has become their God. It has become their, their purpose in their lives. So the second commandment is put in place so that no other image, no other made item will be worshipped in place of God. God is jealous when we are worshiping any created thing. Now, I want to talk to you for just a moment about jealousy and how oftentimes we think of how jealousy is a, is a bad thing. It's, it's a negative thing. And it certainly can be. You know, love is not jealous. But there is a good jealousy. God, in His love for us, warns us 
of making the mistake of worshiping an idol. We can't use an idol for any worship experience. I also want to please uh, point out to you that God is not saying that art is bad. If you're like an artist and you enjoy drawing pictures or making things, art is not bad. I mean, you can use your artistic ability for good. God is against art becoming an idol. And the bottom line here is is we don't need any image, any item, or any man-made thing to worship God. These things aren't real. These statues, these pictures, whatever it is that man has created, will not deliver. It's like fool's gold. It's a cheap substitute for the real thing. It doesn't make sense to direct our our affections and our our time and our efforts to worship a created thing made by the hands of another created thing when we can worship the creator of all things. Our view of God is way too low to ever believe that a picture or an item made by man could ever properly show us who God truly is. We worship him in spirit and in truth. And idolatry is, is nothing but, but a delusion. God made us, and we don't make, make him. And as scripture tells us, we are made in his image. But let me, let me warn you, if you haven't realized in your Christian life so far, that idols can creep into our lives, but they're way more subtle than the statue in our landscaping or the wooden God that's on our mantle in our fireplace. See, we like idols because we can see them, because we can hold them. And ultimately, here's the main reason why we like idols, is we can control them. See, at the root of idolatry is is pride, is, is control. And that is the definition of the evil human heart. I want what I want. I want it when I want it. And I want to be able to control it. Don't give me a God that tells me what to do. Give me a God that fits into my agenda, into my thoughts, into my desires, and into my, my wants. That's why if you study like mythological gods, or I would say almost any false god, it is built upon sexual uh, immorality or money or some sort of human selfish desire. That these false gods promise and promote sexual sin and appeal to the greed and the lust of the eyes. No wonder why they're so popular. No wonder why idols have always been such a popular thing uh, to to, to the human heart. Al Mohler Jr. says it this way, The God that we can control is no God at all. The God that we can conjure, create, and construct is no true deity. We are not the creator. We are the created. God is the sovereign. God is the control. And we are not. God tells us that he is a jealous God. The reason being is that his name as God is the only true name. His character, his nature, his name is being slandered when we worship something other than him. God demands our affections, our worship. What happens if we don't worship him? What happens in our lives and to our families when the Lord God isn't worshiped? isn't loved, isn't feared, and isn't the center of our lives. Our convictions and patterns of worship towards God will affect generations to come. Here's what happens. Generations will be negatively affected by our lack of worship and our reverence towards the Lord God. Let me me simplify it if you're not following your kids will be affected in a good way by the fact that you either love the Lord God and worship Him. That love will model true worship to your family and instill in them a love and an adoration towards the Lord God. But if you get worship wrong, meaning as parents we teach our children that other things are more important than the worship of of God, that results... The results bring spiritual death for generations to come. If you don't believe that how we worship as families affects our families, 
Take a look at this society. The idolatry of, of self is running wild and, and ruining our culture. The judgment of God is on this culture. And we had better see the importance of raising our kids in church, teaching them about God, training them up in the Lord. Because if we don't, the idolatry of this world will swallow them up and spit them out in hell. Our children will feel the impact of their parents who neglect it to teach them about the Lord God. It is so important as parents that we are pouring the law of God, the truth of God, the word of God, the gospel message into our, our kids' lives. My, my study Bible states it this way, children will feel the impact of breaches of God's law by their parents' generation as a natural consequence for its disobedience, its hatred of God. Children who are raised in a household without God have a higher potential of staying on that road, of staying on that road of of not loving God, of not fearing God, and then living a life of idolatry, living their life worshiping their job, worshiping money, worshiping fill-in-the-blank, whatever it it may be, not loving God, not fearing God, and and living a life of, of idolatry. They will likely hate God just as their parents hated God. Well, as we look at that gloomy, dreadful reality here, is that if we are not teaching our children, the odds are is they're going to continue on the same path of, 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 of not following and not loving the Lord God. There's also a beautiful promise here from God to the family, to the one who is faithful to God, It says, he shows steadfast love to thousands of those who who love me and keep my commandments. See, the never-ending, unshakable, unchangeable love of God is promised to those who come to him in faith and repentance and worship him in the way that pleases him. Maybe if you're wondering today, how do I show God love? How how do I show God my, my love and my affection for him? We show love to God by keeping his word and by by loving him and worshiping him the way that his word has told us to worship him and to love him, and that is by keeping his commands. We all need to face the fact today that there's something in our lives. There's something, and and there's been things in my life and there are things in your life that we are all all worshiping. All worshiping. All of us in our lives have something that is a a top priority to us. And here to me, as as I look at the second commandment today, and I've studied through it this week, and I'm I'm giving you this message today, the scary thing about this idea of idolatry is that many of the things that become idols in our lives aren't necessarily bad things. It's the subtle idols that creep into our lives that we don't even realize have become idols. Idols. It's the lie from Satan that preys upon the visual things that we see with our own two eyes. I'll take you back all the way to Genesis and think about Eve when she was tempted in the garden. She was gazing upon the fruit that was forbidden and it delighted her eyes. What is it that delights your eyes? What is it that is causing you that you're, you're looking at it, you're seeing it, and it's something that you want so badly and it has become your God. Maybe it's the, the car sitting in your garage. Or, or is it the God of this universe? Is it the sports that we play? Or is it the God of heaven, of earth? Is it the money that we make? The business that we own? Or is it the one true God? We so wrestle with this in our lives daily. And what I'm talking about is the visual things. The things that are so attractive to the eye. The things that promise instant gratification. The things that look so good and they're right there to touch. They're right there to uh, have. They're they're, they're just right there for instant gratification. And I get it. I, I understand it. We've all done it. We've all been a part of the visual thing and that visual thing overwhelming our lives and even kind of subtly becoming, becoming our, our God the things that promise instant gratification. But understanding that the Bible speaks very very differently. 
the most important things in the whole world are not the things that we see with our own eyes. The most important thing in this world are not the things that we visually see. I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And I want to give you the definition biblically of what faith is. What does faith look like? What are the things that we hope for? What is true faith? Listen to what it says here. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Everything that we see with our eyes, as, as I look around this room today, as I, I look around at this, this world, everything that we see is, is fading. We, we look into the mirror, and whether we want to admit it or not, we are slowly fading every single day. These empty promises of Satan are fading. We must fix our eyes upon that which is eternal, that which will last forever, that which is the most important thing, and that is having a faith in the Lord God and coming to Him in faith and repentance and trusting in His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want you to take away from this message, well, I guess I shouldn't enjoy my life. I guess I shouldn't have fun. No, enjoy your life. Enjoy recreation. Enjoy your family. But above all of that, hold on to what matters the most. And what matters the most is coming to a faith in Jesus Christ as the payment for your sins. Loving God and, and loving His, His Word. Keeping the Word. Loving His commandments and, and keeping those commandments. Filling your mind with His Word. Depositing His Word into your life so that the lies and the schemes of this world will not trip you up. I, I want to close today by giving you just kind of a a bottom line thing today. Augustine simplified it when he said it this way. There are in the end only two loves. There is love of God and there is love of self. And in the end, every idol comes down to love of self. We fabricate the idol, we fashion it, we feed it, we control it, and we admire its beauty. And in the end, it is us. There we are as idolaters. Church, I don't want to preach um, at you today. I want to preach to myself as well that we've all struggled with idolatry. And like I said, kind of in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way at the beginning of the message, I'm not saying that you're physically bowing down to a statue and you're landscaping or you don't believe that the, you know, the, the statue is, is giving you any spiritual value. But what happens in our lives as Christians more subtly is the, the, the idols that creep into our lives. And as we come to a close today, I just want to I want to pray uh, that the Lord would reveal to your heart and to my heart continually the things that are subtly creeping in and threatening to take the place of the one true God, because He is a jealous God and He demands our full devotion, our full love, our full worship, and our full adoration. But then also understanding the kind of cause and effect here that as, as parents, as grandparents, as Members of this church, we have an obligation to teach our children these truths. And if we don't, the results will likely be, if we don't teach them, they'll probably continue on that same path of not loving, the, loving God, not loving His Word. But then on the flip side, the promise of, of blessing and, and God's, God's hand upon our, our generations to come as we continue to invest in our kids, invest in the gospel, and invest in this, this unshakable truth of, of God's gospel. Let's have a word of prayer today. Lord, today I thank you for these commandments. Oftentimes we, we approach rules with this mindset of, don't tell me what to do. And Father, that definitely defines all of us. You know, it's easy to, to point the finger and to look at society and, and to see that. And Father, we need to, to submit to your word Submit to your law. Submit to the truth of Scripture, Father. And we need to see the importance of sharing this with our, with our children. To see the importance of pouring into them your truth and your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, I, I pray for those today who've listened to this message that, that maybe don't know you, um, don't have a relationship with you through your son Jesus. 
that Father, today, that they can be reconciled to you. They can be, that broken relationship can be fixed by them coming to faith in Jesus and asking Jesus to be the forgiver of their sins and the leader of their life. And Father, we thank you for this glorious gospel message. Thank you for saving me. And thank you for this, this time together we've had today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.